This is a discussion of Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park, Wyoming, uh, USA. A mega volcano. It's April 2022. Yellowstone is usually regarded as the land of geysers. There's probably more uh, geysers in that given area than anywhere, or almost certainly than anywhere else in the world. This is steamboat because it, it actually used to be very regular in eruption, not as regular as uh, Old Faithful, which is famous, but uh, it's uh, dropped off now to quite irregular eruptions, maybe only few, every few years. But this is a rather spectacular one of uh, 1984 in the Yellowstone National Park. So, um, we're sitting there near the top corner of Wyoming, northwest corner, near the border of Idaho, or Montana to the north. And uh, this red outline is the edge of the subsidence caldera from the last enormous eruption of about 630,000 years ago. And of course, there's the old faithful geyser uh, Mark, just to show you the region where most of the uh, geysers actually occur today. Subsequence included the uh, uh, formation of the very large Yellowstone Lake. Famous uh, is the Grand Prismatic Spring, which is about 100 metres across. In fact, when, when visiting it, it looks even further than that. It's very spectacular for yellow and orange uh, microbial mats, which uh, uh, mark the edges of the uh, hot saline pool. It's a geothermal spring, of course, and one of many in that region of the Yellowstone Park. It's famous for these huge eruptions, and uh, the very large ones seem to occur every six, 700,000 years, or well, that's the assumption. Um, and uh, the last one uh, marked as uh, some 240 cubic miles of rock pulverized and distributed over much of the United States in a huge series of eruptions, probably from caldera rings and from um, eruption centers within that main caldera, which evacuated a huge magma chamber and allowed the subsidence of the um, Caldera, which is oh, 80 kilometres across, 30 or 40 kilometres wide. But uh, over 2 million years ago, uh, the first eruption in this site was uh, more than twice the size of that. And huge volume of um, ash was distributed again across much of the southern region of the United States, rather than perhaps the very west coast. Again, a third significant eruption about uh, 1.3 million years ago gives this periodicity of huge eruptions. There have been several hundred eruptions, even probably in the last million years, but none of them of this scale in, within that caldera region. Now, these compare with, uh, say, the Mount St. Helens eruption, probably also the Mount Gambia eruptions just really a fraction of a cubic mile of rock pulverized and distributed in ash. So the very much larger scale. Here's an indication of the spread of those eruptions uh, in faint outline or region of the United States and these uh, distribution patterns, the 640,000 year ago uh, eruption uh, spreading right down to the Gulf Coast, California, a great Gulf Coast of Mexico, and uh, uh, the lesser one of 1.3 million years ago, uh, just covering the central region of the United States. The uh, Mount St. Helen eruption of 1980 near Seattle is shown right up in the top uh, northwest corner of the state, spreading eastward from its center in the Cascade Mountains. There's actually uh, a significant uh, plain extending to the west of Yellowstone, which in this particular thing is 
chat line in red and yellow stands right up in the uh, eastern corner of that near the limit of the Rocky Mountains. And we can see the uh, uh, Rocky Mountain front, very, very wide mountain system with the extension of the Basin and Range province that look like a series of cattle, uh, caterpillars crawling uh, northwards towards the Snake River Plain. Dark there, I guess, is the Great Salt Lake um, with um, uh, the main highway running across the United States marked in, in solid line. The first sighting by a European of uh, Yellowstone was in 1870 when an army lieutenant, a part of an exploration uh, expedition uh, in the territory of Wyoming, came to the uh, summit of Mount Washington and looking to the south and west, all he could see was a stretch where the mountains were missing. Um, accustomed to seeing uh, mountain ranges of the Rockies every uh, from every high point, it was quite uh, an outstanding feature. And of course, they subsequently discovered the um, Valley of Geysers and uh, salt and um, uh, geothermal springs. And this is roughly what it looks like uh, from Mount Washburn, um, looking to the southwest, I guess, or to the south. Uh, remarkable Teton range in the south, which is ski fields and the like. Those rocks actually are roughly the age of our Flinders Ranges, something the order of six, seven hundred million years, um, and uh, were probably formed as a, an ocean margin to uh, the Laurentian continent or the North American continent at that time, in reasonable proximity to uh, our Flinders Ranges, which were our eastern coastal rocks. So there was no eastern Australia, no western US, and no Pacific Ocean 700 million years ago. Uh, it was part of a supercontinent, Rodinia, that separated and formed continental shelves, of which these rocks are part. However, the Teton Range extends uh, southward to Jackson Hole, which is a famous ski locality, and uh, uh, very beautiful uh, landscapes around the Snake River on the uh, eastern slopes of the Teton Range. Anyway, there's uh, again in red the outline of the caldera. Uh, the yellow movement along the fault, there was a vertical lift of uh, 22 feet or uh, you know six meters or seven meters. Also marked as the mammoth area in the top, very top of the um, state of Wyoming. And uh, that's remarkable for huge center terraces, rather like the terraces that once existed in the North Island of New Zealand. And the other outline is the uh, Yellowstone National Park, which I think is the oldest national park uh, anywhere in the world. Well, there's the Hebgen um, Lake Fault exposed after the uh, 1949 earthquake. And it says uh, a 22 foot throw in parts of that uh, fault. So you can imagine that was a very significant, I think it was of the order of a seven magnitude in that region. And it caused this enormous Madison uh, Canyon landslide that blocked the canyon, formed a, an artificial lake, and uh, it was 80 million tonnes of rocks slid off the uh, Caldera margin which stands in relief on that, along that northern edge, in contrast to the southern side where it's covered partially by uh, Yellowstone Lake. Here again is a view from the south. These are the Teton Ranges and the Snake uh, River Valley uh, uh, Grand Teton National Park in the, in the bottom left. The border of the state of Wyoming and Idaho running uh, diagonally up to the top. And there again, outlined in red, is the Yellowstone Caldera. And we can see the Caldera margin, the hills on the northern side. Um, two small lakes near West Yellowstone in the top end. And uh, that's where the Hebden Fault is marked again in black.
we were you know, in the National Park in autumn, no, spring one year just after as the thaw was beginning and the first tourists allowed in. And uh, apart from the bison and uh, things at night, there was the howling of wolves, which they'd very recently released, particularly in that Hebden Hills area. The wolves have actually uh, created a new biosphere. They've amazingly helped the elk and the, um, uh, will probably cut down the elk populations, which are very strong. Uh, the bison have developed because uh, with lessening of the elk, there's been much more growth, uh, much more pasture for the um, bison, introduced bison, I believe, reintroduced, uh, to have flourished. And there's all sorts of other ancillary uh, benefits from the reintroduction of wolves. Anyway, apart from that Yellowstone called Deera, there's another one marked on the left-hand edge of this block uh, diagram or illustration, uh, Island Park. And uh, that is uh, a, one of the previous called era uh, marked as the number two. How do these uh, called era develop? Well, uh, there's a bit of controversy as about whether the plume of heat comes all the way from the uh, some 3,000 kilometers from the uh, outer liquid core of the Earth, or whether in fact there is such a, a plume of heat and then it redevelops high in the mantle as a rising uh, magma body of basaltic composition. And uh, it's certainly a hot spot. Uh, it's a feature of a hot spot under a continent, probably the, or it's certainly the best known example in the world. Another one, surprisingly, is centered on uh, Victoria and uh, Western Victoria and uh, Mount Gambia region, but it's nowhere near as significant as the Yellowstone uh, phenomenon. Anyway, with a huge eruption, of course, uh, that granitic magma body, uh, which is a partial melt with more silica than the main basaltic magmas, um, it uh, has evacuated as a huge er eruption, release of gases and fluids, uh, mainly as ash, and a lot of it around the margins, no doubt, along those boundary faults, which are circular rim-shaped structures. And these would cause, cause surges of ash flows, which um, eventually extended across much of the United States. And you notice where the earthquake epicenters are shown all surrounding the area, which has been rising as a result of the heat mass underneath it. And the final phases of big eruptions are the, is the circulation of geothermal water with um, geysers and also bulging, causing resurgent domes and often little um, bodies of granitic composition or lavas that have intruded as uh, mounds. These would be hundreds of meters across, of course, uh, but they often occur in a sort of circular pattern. And uh, the circulation of groundwater results in the hot springs and geysers. Well, there's a, an idea of the uh, origin of these from the outer core of the Earth. Um, and uh, it's something of the order of 3,000 kilometers down, but probably uh, around 100 or 150 kilometers down, uh, there's huge magma chambers develop. Uh, we're uncertain of the nature of the circulation of the fluids within the mantle, call them fluids, circulation of the uh, material within the mantle. So we're not uh, really confident of um, how that detail occurs. However, when we look at uh, a three-dimensional satellite image of the Western portion of the United States, the most outstanding feature is a phenomenon of the basin and range region, which has been extended 100% uh, in the last 20 million years or so since the subduction of the um, uh, eastern half of the Pacific Ocean beneath North America. 
there's been an extension phenomenon of the Rocky Mountains that has really doubled the size of a state like Nevada and caused an enormous array of normal faults or down-dropped faults. Uh, but that doesn't explain the uh, uh, Snake River Plain. The Columbia Plateau is a region of uh, huge basaltic um, uh, effusion or uh, volcanism. The Snake Plain has these features uh, which are quite distinctive, and we'll look at those, I believe. Uh, here we are. Uh, the green patch right in the center is the Snake River Plain, and within it, rather vaguely outlined here in yellow, are these series of calderas. There's the, um, or caldera, I suppose is the plural, um, those that uh, are centered right in the top uh, east region, marked as um, 630,000 years ago, 1.3 and 2 million years ago, are effectively the three large ones that. Uh, we discussed earlier, but then as you move to the southwest, there's some between 4.3 and 6.5 million years, and then between 7 and 10 million years, and then uh, between 8.6 and 10.5, and another group between 12, going finally to 15 to 16 million years old in the um, uh, left-hand margin region in the state of Oregon. How is this so? Well, the black arrow in the top right-hand corner is the direction of plate movement of the North American plate, and it is effectively moving across the hotspot. And in 16 million years, um, the plate has moved the, the distance from Yellowstone to Oregon, uh, and it has carried away as uh, extinct volcanic centers or huge caldera that uh, remain inactive, uh, therefore forming the uh, Snake River Plain, because regions that for many years existed as uh, geothermal springs, geysers, geysers, et cetera, had finally moved off the hotspot. And uh, uh, with increasing age, the further you get from Yellowstone. So that's a characteristic um, phenomenon. It's interesting to see the distribution of earthquake epicenters currently uh, around the hotspot. So they're distributed um, almost like a bow wave pushing its uh, way through the plate. Hotspots we've uh, discussed on uh, other occasions. A uh, remarkable one, of course, is Iceland, which is uh, mid at the North Atlantic continental ridge, the trail going back to Greenland, indicating the movement of the North American plate or the enlarging of the North American plate from the central ridge, not so much the movement of the plate in that case as the uh, um, spread of ocean has uh, moved away from the hotspot, carrying evidence of that volcanism with it. Then there's Hawaii, and in fact, when you look at the Pacific, there are only three or so marked here, but there are several more, and there are a number around Africa and within the African continent also hotspots, one being uh, associated with the uh, intersection of the Red Sea, the Gulf of uh, Arabia, and the Eastern Rift of Africa. Uh, it's parked there. Uh, just east of the word African plate, or it's not marked there, but should be. You'll notice there's one showing um, in northeast Tasmania. I think that's a misplaced point. I think that should be featured west of Melbourne as far as Mount Gambia. I don't believe it's valid. Some volcanoes on northwest Tasmania, but I think they've become mixed up there with the uh, the older one of Jurassic age, which is the central plateau of Tasmania. That uh, outline are the major hotspots of um, the Earth, a number of them along the uh, Southern Atlantic Ridge and uh, Canary Islands, etc. They are presumably all derived from heat from the outer core of the Earth and seem to have remained in position for a very long time because, uh, in the case of Hawaii, 
you know, somewhere now 42 to 50 million years ago, one can record a change in direction of the movement of the plate, which is also seen in the Pitcairn line and the McDonnell line. It gives a good indication of the movement of Earth's plates because it's assumed these have stayed in their same relative position as plumes of heat coming from the outer core of the Earth. There's an outline of the Hawaiian ridge with the um, a change in direction uh, to become the Emperor Seamount chain. And it's finally being subducted under the Aleutian Trench, the subduction zone between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. So if we look back about um, two million years, we see the plume uh, featured in this block diagram. It drove three huge eruptions in that period and has now settled into a karma phase, powering the Yellowstone's uh, geysers and mud pots and hot springs, etc. It's shown there uh, as the Na Yellowstone National Park on the eastern side of the surface. The direction of plate movement following the arrow has carried away the 6 million, 12 million, and 18 million year old caldera, which are now quite extinct and forming the Snake River Plain. Further to the west, you have a subduction zone along the western margin of the North American plate is now subducting, and uh, it more or less corresponds to the margin of the North American plate, which is a unique situation and has involved subduction of the um, central ridge in places. And the Yuan de Fuca plate is almost entirely uh, subducted now. That, of course, gives rise to a very different form of volcano in the Cascade Ranges, the likes of Mount St. Helens, uh, Mount Shasta, and so on, which are um, subduction-related volcanoes, quite different to the um, huge plume-like structures of Yellowstone. Just looking at the relative size of these, uh, not perhaps taking the largest of all, but uh, one two million years ago, some 600 cubic miles of material, and looking down through the various eruptive phases until we get to, uh, well, Island Park is that uh, older one now removed from the cent main centre of um, thermal activity at 1.3 million years ago and was some 67 cubic uh, miles of powdered rock, pulverised rock. Uh, one of the largest eruptions that affected Earth's climate uh, in 1815 was quite large in Indonesia, 36 cubic miles, uh, an enormous eruption that caused uh, decimation of early populations and uh, uh, famine, etc., around uh, the regions east of Lombok uh, and Bali. And another, um, which caused the Crater Lake in Oregon, Mount uh, Mazama, which is uh, only 7,600 years ago, uh, erupted some 18 cubic miles. And uh, these are a bit smaller in scale, probably, than the northern New Zealand uh, Lake Taupo eruptions. Uh, in the last, in that period, last 12, 15,000 years. Krakatoa, although highly regarded for its enormous uh, um, explosion and eruption in 1883, was only four cubic miles. And uh, Mount Pinatubo affected our climate for a couple of years. Uh, finally, about two and a half, may well be. Uh, between that and Mount St. Helens, that uh, the Mount Gambia eruptions, which there were eight or so, eight or ten perhaps, um, would have erupted something in the order of uh, one to two cubic miles of powdered rock as ash. Here then again is the uh, eruption history of Yellowstone, the main eruptive phases, a huge caldera reactivation as magma built up in the um, around the active hotspot at depth perhaps uh, the order of 100 kilometers where the plate movement actually takes place the plates are 
plates themselves for the order of 100 kilometers thick. And uh, it no doubt bulged that probably existing caldera and finally uh, erupted with enormous re release of volatiles because of the release of pressure. Um, there's been gases and fluids, water, saline water, and steam. Huge ash clouds would have developed and spread uh, southeastwards across the states. As this main eruption quietened, you'd move on to the, what we call the Snake River Plain phase, um, a little bit of Vulcan, basic volcanism, and I say a little bit, possibly hundreds of eruptions since that main one in the Yellowstone National Park, quite larger bodies in the subsurface, perhaps breaking through as a ring of more acidic volcanoes, that is with more silica included than the basaltic volcanism, at depth, uh, much more iron-rich igneous rock. So that's uh, shown as occurring in the top uh, 10 or 12 miles of depth, whereas the, uh, in this case, the magma chamber is probably uh, nearer to 100 kilometers, some 50 miles down. Here's another portrayal from the National Geographic of the sleeping giant with this heat mass sitting um, at relatively shallow depth, ready to cause another eruption at some stage. And uh, a little apocryphy of depth uh, arising from uh, a, what should we say, a, a whole front of heat that's come from the inner mantle or the uh, uh, outer core of the Earth. And the rim of the subsidence of the caldera is quite obvious in the north, and this is the region uh, where that huge landslip occurred, in, uh, uh, a natural lake. Drainage breaks through that range, probably uh, uh, through faulted gaps, or maybe uh, uh, originally the drainage was going through before that substance occurred and it's cut its way through uh, along its old course as canyons. And this uh, occurs along the Yellowstone River itself and gives rise to the Yellowstone Can Canyon. So this is a picture of the northwest rim looking to the, in that direction from the Yellowstone Park. This map of the National Park region, essentially in Montana, it shows all the hydrothermal features, geysers, hot springs, and steam fumaroles, mud pots, etc. cetera. Uh, when I say mud pots, uh, some tens of meters across, you often get uh, bubbling, boiling mud, which uh, people use for cooking their uh, bacon and eggs, but you wouldn't want to be stepping into one. And there you can see the caldera margin outlined, in this case in black, cutting through the Yellowstone Lake, and they usually demonstrate cooking eggs or something for uh, visitors using uh, bubbling hot springs within the Yellowstone Lake. Uh, you'll notice the main concentration of uh, geysers are in the uh, lower geyser basin or the midway uh, on that western section of the caldera. And here's a typical view uh, of one of these hot springs, small geyser, if you like. Um, often there are mounds of uh, lime or silica that have come out of um, solution from the very saline groundwaters. Uh, these will form a rim marginal to the um, mud pool. And uh, in the far distance there is the caldera rim. This is in these sulfur springs basin. Colors are not well demonstrated here. They're often bright, bright yellows, patches of green where um, algae or other things favor the uh, salinity. Wide areas of desolation. And in fact, uh, new eruptive phases often destroy big sections of the forest. There's another uh, view across the areas with steam fumaroles. Uh, uh, rising across a rather desolate plain, and uh, this takes a long time 
to um, develop into pastoral areas again as the uh, region moves away from the hotspot due to the movement of the plate. There's um, uh, that outstanding, oh, I'm not sure what guys of that one is. It may well be Old Faithful, but it doesn't look like the area. Um, but um, beautiful ejection of steam as the groundwaters percolate through the very hot rocks of depth. They get to uh, superheated circumstances, locked in by uh, inability to break through to surface. And then when this suddenly occurs or the pot boils over, um, in the case of Old Faithful, it used to occur very regularly at 24 hours or so um, spacing, but I think it's more irregular these days. And here's an idea of the fracturing of depth. The passage of um, groundwaters would come up one central uh, conduit and fire up into the air due to the uh, explosive uh, boiling of saline waters below, above the normal boiling point because of the salinity. But the cold waters would circulate back again and take time to heat up. So the upper geyser basin with Old Faithful is shown there on the right, and the Emerald Pool, uh, et cetera, on the left. They would be hot springs rather than geysers in that case. It's one of the um, uh, views, the rainbow hot springs. Colours uh, are not outstanding in this particular series of photographs that I've selected, but often you get, um, uh, as I say, rainbow colours or reflection of sky, etc., in the um, pools. And uh, often uh, foam or uh, limey encrustations occur uh, in the uh, floating salts. Again, uh, Emerald Pool in the Upper Geyser Basin uh, goes to extraordinary depth. You wouldn't want to try scuba diving because you'd soon find yourself fried. Working a little bit away from the Caldera area, there's another uh, hot springs at Mammoth to the north of the Yellowstone region. I guess it's still within the National Park, very close to the uh, uh, borders in the north. And uh, uh, here's a picture of uh, elk running in front of the Sinter covered slopes. Um, these are very like the Sinter Springs of the uh, pink cliffs of uh, North Island, New Zealand that were destroyed in the eruption of the 1880s. Huge uh, and very spectacular um, material that's come out of solution from the uh, hot springs. Often it's silica in composition, may well be carbonate, depending on the uh, actual composition of those groundwaters. Now, looking at the regional geology bit, uh, if uh, we look back um, at the uh, region to the south of Yellowstone, and this actually is a view northward um, across the ranges, there's a very clear old plateau um, in the Teton Range, and it's apparently dates back some 34 million years old. And of course, that's uh, uh, older than much of that uh, volcanism in the Snake River Plain. So clearly, uh, uh, looking back at that period, it's really about the time the uh, Rocky Mountains were highly deformed and compressed and then eroded away, and that surface is remnant there. Uh, it's been tilted very much to the westward, closer to Yellowstone in the Teton Range, north of um, Jackson Hole. And there in that diagram, there's a white line I've drawn showing how that um, land surface is tilted by faulting. And the fault is shown in cross section here, which has elevated the Teton Mountains extraordinarily and caused a um, uh, what we call a hearth graben. So there's uh, gravels and sands being deposited on top of limestone and volcanic ash. Much of that might have been derived from expl earlier explosions of uh, the uh, main 
hotspot earlier than Yellowstone and lower down volcanic ash again over with conglomerates that would have been major phases of eruption. And these again, overlying slightly folded rocks, which are remnants of the front of the Rocky Mountain orogeny or the mountain building of the Rocky Mountains more than 20 million years ago. So at the foot of the uh, Teton Range, which is the one I said relates, uh, the rocks there relate pretty closely to our Flinders Ranges, Adelaide Hills regions. They're being eroded uh, into the Snake River, and there are quite uh, remarkable levels of um, outwash fans and uh, alluvial terraces along the uh, Snake River. Here's one example. Uh, that's the Teton Range, its most remarkable point. Uh, glaciers used to come down those valleys in the ice ages of the last million years or the last two million years. There's been uh, a dozen or more ice ages and greenhouses in the last million years, and uh, hundreds of metres thickness of ice would have carried down that glacial valley there, spread out and um, gradually melted into this um, moraine, the terminal moraine, dumping its rock there, which has formed a natural dam and a natural lake as a result of the uh, glacier. And there's an idea of it there with Grand Teton, the very view that we were looking at a moment ago, Teton fault in front of it, causing subsidence uh, in the region from which this drawing is done, a terminal moraine giving a more or less uh, semicircular barrier, which has blocked off the drainage and left you with the Jenny Lake. <clears throat> so that's an illustration of what it might have looked like as recently as perhaps 15 or 18,000 years ago, and many times during the last 2 million years, interspersed with uh, a dozen or so greenhouse periods when uh, it's likely the glaciers almost entirely disappeared. In fact, the whole Yellowstone area, shown here in slightly oblique view, with the Grand Teton Park uh, in the bottom left corner here, there was over a kilometre of ice, and a full ice cap developed over the Yellowstone Range at times during these ice ages. As I say, up to a kilometre thickness of ice, various glaciers ran into that uh, lower area. But then uh, in the greenhouse periods, it would have receded significantly because eruptions were occurring all the time. And uh, that would have locally melted the ice and caused great floods of water uh, to cut the canyons deeper. And one of those canyons is uh, in the older period of uh, eruptives, the 630,000 year old lavas that were uh, from that very from the huge eruption uh, of that time. And they've been much altered by geothermal fluids and they uh, actually the colors don't do these justice. There are a lot of oranges and reds through that um, creamy color. The um, geothermal groundwaters have uh, weathered the rocks or altered the rocks significantly because the mel melting of ice from the ice cap uh, renewed the vigor of the streams and resulted in the waterfalls and rapid flow, which has caused the down cutting of the Yellowstone Canyon. Looking at the uh, estimated ash fallout from a similar eruption to uh, the giant eruptions of Yellowstone, it seems at uh, 300 kilometers from the center, you'd still be facing almost a metre of ash, which would destroy most towns and cities. You just couldn't get rid of a metre of ash deposited everywhere. And of course, enormous areas of the uh, grain fields of the uh, Western flatlands um, would be destroyed by being covered in ash for um, three to 500 kilometres from the Yellowstone area. And even an inch at a thousand miles away um, which would take you into the state of California, probably. That, those contours then, uh, the estimated ashfall thicknesses in feet um, from 
another enormous eruption. In white is what would be regarded as a, a small volcanic eruption, and these are quite frequent. It might well be expected within the next hundred years that we'd have uh, a small eruption, and that would even influence significant areas of Idaho, etc. Yes, so it's certainly a, a phenomenon that is a worry to uh, the future of the United States. And uh, in the late in the 1990s, the uh, caldero had, was noted to be expanding. I think it still is. Um, and that's the major eruption area of the caldera. It was formed during the last major eruption, uh, perhaps uh, 600,000 years ago, but it has risen as much as 2.8 inches a year over the past decade. And uh, that's of the order of um, six uh, centimetres. So that's an enormous rate of rise and a cause for concern about, uh, well, further earthquakes in particular, and uh, maybe the fact that the heat is um, developing to such an extent another eruption will occur. Yes, I'll just put there the uh, uh, major eruptions and comparing them with the 1991 Pinatubo uh, eruption in the Philippines, which caused uh, enormous damage. We've forgotten the extent to which it influenced populations in the Philippines, but um, even uh, uh, 1.3 million years ago, or particularly the 640,000 years, um, eruptions were just so much larger uh, that uh, uh, it's hard to conceive of the damage it would do in the United States. I'll just read this. Um, the hydrothermal explosions occur in Yellowstone National Park every few years. They form a crater just a few meters across. Every few thousand years, one will form a crater a few hundred meters across. They're not only hydrothermal explosions, but some, of course, erupt uh, basalts and you get lava flows filling the hollows in the uh, caldera region. Uh, the past 20 eruptions of Yellowstone have been lava flows with no significant amount of ash fall outside of Yellowstone. And 60 to 80 eruptions over the last half million years would have had uh, and the whole of those eruptions would have little regional impact outside the park. But, uh, the 1991 eruption, Mount uh, Pinatubo in the Philippines, was about a thousand times smaller. It had cooled the Earth's surface for three years, however, and the uh, global temperatures dropped by nearly a degree. However, the 664,000 year eruption of Yellowstone apparently didn't significant alter Earth's warming at the time. And up in the top uh, right-hand diagram, I've got the, um, well, it's a combination of, or two graphs there. One is the uh, uh, ice core information on temperatures, which they can do from tiny inclusions of gas within the ice. Uh, and they can estimate temperatures from uh, the isotope ratios of oxygen I won't go into the details of how that's done, but it gives a measure of the uh, size of the ice caps or the uh, uh, amount of evaporation from the oceans, which has been locked up in ice rather than falling back to the sea. I've shown there the red line at time of eruption 664,000 years ago. Time is going from uh, right to left. So that's the period 800, 600, 400,000 years ago, and at 664,000 years ago, Earth was warming on a trend, um, although there may be a dip as indicated by the uh, ice cores in that rise to the peak of greenhouse, which occurs just to the left of the red line. It didn't cause significant Earth cooling. It didn't change the pattern of greenhouse development. So it would appear that even if there were another huge eruption like that 600 and 64,000 years uh, eruption shown over on the left is 640,000, I must admit. Uh, that third eruption um, of 240 cubic miles of rock pulverized, it didn't darken the earth and cool the atmosphere significantly enough to stop a greenhouse climb. 
Those greenhouses are repeated every 100,000 years from astronomical causes, from the shape of the Earth's orbit and the orientation of Earth, its wobble, etc. It's well calculated and has been known for 100 years that uh, Earth very likely went through greenhouse and alternate ice house periods a dozen times over the last million years. And uh, we are currently in a probably similar situation to uh, that of 664,000 years ago. In fact, if uh, we look around Mount Gambia, perhaps it's 664,000 years ago, we can't do it exactly, of course, but we would be about on the coastal margin here in Mount Gambia, 35 kilometres inland, because it was a major greenhouse. And we've had very, very slight uplift subsequently here in the southeast, which has stranded the um, coastal dunes like the Wokewine Dune of 120,000 years ago and others like the Baker's Range, which are about this age, and the dunes on which Mount Gambia is built, which are probably half a million thousand years old. In discussing climate change, of course, one is always concerned with the amount of carbon dioxide released during major volcanic eruptions. We have no uh, overall estimate uh, for the huge eruptions of Yellowstone, or for that matter, other major volcanic eruptions like Taupo, or those of, that occurred in Indonesia in uh, past uh, history. Yellowstone has an enormous amount of uh, hydrothermal activity, and of course, gas is associated with this, and there are up to 3,000 earthquakes a year. And uh, a large part of this are earthquake swarms, which may amount to uh, 100 over a period of a month or two. Currently, the degassing rate of Yellowstone thermal areas are estimated at around uh, 45 million kilograms per day of carbon dioxide. This is a significant figure. The big flakes like Hebden uh, in 1959 may be related to movement on the Rocky Mountain front although the caldera has been rising generally. Swarms of up to a thousand small earthquakes uh, uh, tend to herald uh, concern, but they uh, probably represent magma movement or the movement of volatiles, uh, hydrothermal liquids, etc., at depth. Earthquake tomography, which is rather like the tomography of the body in a scan, has indicated the structure below at depths of 2, 8, 35, and even up to 70 and 100 kilometre depth. And the mantle plume at 70 kilometres is notably uh, drawn out in the direction of movement of the plate. And one assumes, therefore, that the lithosphere uh, is only about 70 kilometres thick at this point. Uh, the lower crustal body at uh, depths of 30 to 40 kilometres is huge and has a volume of 46,000 cubic kilometres, almost five times the size of the upper crustal magma, which is rhyolitic in composition. That means it has um, differentiated from the lower body uh, and includes a lot more quartz and lighter material, whereas the basaltic uh, mass has little or no quartz. This effectively rounds up uh, the general knowledge on Yellowstone and uh, leaves us open to many questions which can follow at this point. Thank you all. That's the end of this presentation on Yellowstone.